Uh, again, let's just introduce it formally first, and then we can try to discuss with you methods of finding that inverse. That's where you will need to crunch a lot of numbers. Again, I will do it formally, and formally we do inverses only for square matrices. That is what reflected in my choice of an indices here. You see N and N, the square matrix, the same number of rows, the columns and the rows, the number of rows, and the number of columns is the same. N is an integer. Again, I will need the symbols for my entries, and I use my regular convention. Little a will represent the entries of matrix A. This is the first time we have a formal definition. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not the first time, actually, when we discussed plus uh, operational times so scaling. That was also a formal definition, but it wasn't much of a sentencing. I mean, it's just the formula for the definition. Here we need to say some plain English words, which is always harder to do from some of us. So we say that matrix is invertible if we can present another matrix of the same size, square one, such that we such that we have this relation. The AB product and BA product will be identity matrix. That's the symbol we fix for the identity matrix. It's, there's no widespread, wide acceptable, widely accepted convention, I say, I should say how people denote identity metrics in different, even in this uni, in different courses, they use different symbols. But in this course, I will try to stick with this notation. That's the one which also you probably used. That's similar to the one you used in the first year. It's the identity metrics of size one, of size N, I should say. And the identity metrics, again, if you've never seen it before, you may find it surprising. That, it's not the, it, that, that it is not the matrix which is filled with ones, like for instance, zero matrix. If someone asks you what the zero matrix is, even if you never saw it, you probably, your first guess will be the correct one. Seems like a natural thing just to fill the matrix with zeros. But with the identity, the choice, if you see it for the first time, if you don't know any motivation for that, it seems strange. We don't fill the matrix with ones, we do very, Interesting thing, actually, we fill only the diagonal of that matrix with ones. Again, if you see it for the first time, it, it, you might find it strange. Um, I'd say you probably did find it strange if you saw it when you saw it for the first time. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's my definition of the identity met. Uh, sorry, of the inverse. It's not mine. It actually well-known established definition of the inverse. So it's a matrix which works as a cancellation factor. That's a matrix which works as a cancellation factor. Actually, speaking of the identity matrix, the reason for this choice, if you don't know it, the, the only and the most significant motivation for this choice of the, for the choice of the identity this way, is that if you multiply any matrix by the identity from either side, that will not change the matrix. So it behaves like number one in the number domain. In the number domain, if you multiply any number by number one, the number doesn't change. That's the reason we call it identity. That's the reason we call this matrix identity. And if you ever attempted to multiply a matrix by a matrix which is filled with ones everywhere, you realize that the result will not be the same. So that matrix, that choice, which seems to be first choice or first guess, it doesn't work like an identity. Whereas this one does. Even though verifying that, actually that's, that's some sort of proof, that's some sort of statement which, might, which must be proved somehow. Right. <clears throat> So the reason for the inverse again, it's the, um, oh, sorry, the, the inverse, it's the matrix which works as a cancellation factor for original matrix A. Quite a, few, quite a few things are strange about the inverses. I mean, if, if you compare this to the number domain, there are some significant differences. One of them is that in a number domain, 
in a number domain, no matter real numbers or complex numbers or rational numbers, you have only one distinct number which doesn't have the universe, right? It's a number zero. That's the one which doesn't have an universe. Every other number has a very distinct, very unique inverse. Two has a half, half has a two, and so on. With the matrices, the subset of those matrices, sorry, the subset of those matrices which do not have inverse far larger than single zero matrix. For instance, here's an example. I just made up quickly here on the slide. Look at this matrix. One, one, zero, zero, two by two matrix. If I aim, if I aim to find the inverse for this matrix, I will fail. Because if I aim to find some unknown matrix which has some unknown components, so the one which sits here, in a way that after I times it, the result will be identity of size two. I will never achieve this effect. The reason for that, of course, is, my, is the matrix, the way we do matrix multiplication. Because we have zero row here, every time I compute the product entries in the second row, I will need to dot product this row with the columns here. And no matter what's the content of those columns, because here I'm facing zero row, the dot product will be zero all the time. No matter how hard you will try to fill this, there will be zeros here. These dots represent the, that there will be some strange exp expressions in the first two entries. I don't care. It's irrelevant for what we discuss. What's relevant is that the second row will always be zero, and hence I cannot achieve unity in this place. That's what's required for the identity of size two. Identity of size two, it's a, oh, sorry. Identity of size two, I'm sorry. It's a matrix of this structure, 1, 0, 0, 1. Hmm. Yeah. That's the identity of size 2. Because of this effect, the 0 row does on the product, no matter what, what you do here, it's absolutely irrelevant. This 0 row vanishes rows. This one will never happen here. And hence, this matrix cannot have an inverse. That's the simplest way to argue that. So this is one of the features which makes matrix multiplication significantly different to number numerical multiplication. Hence, the experience you had there, it should, when you transfer this to matrices, it should be, it should be done carefully. It's a new object, new operation for you. <clears throat> well, the second, of course, distinct feature, which, doesn't, which is not present in the numerical domain, is that your product is not commutative, of course, as well. So you cannot change the order of factors arbitrarily, arbitrarily without affecting the result. Yeah, I mean, this is, not, this is, this is rest, less relevant. It's a content which I put on the slide as well. It's like a one side one-sided relations. It's less relevant to the inverse, uh, but I just open it for you. Sometimes you may have these relations in one side only, like for instance in this case, you see I chose these two matrices with such content and such content. If you do the product, the result will be one, which is the identity matrix of dimension one, of size one. Hence, this seems to be acting like an inverse. I mean, the second factor seems to be acting like an inverse for the first factor, right? Product equals identity. But if you attempt this product in the other way, this is no longer the identity. If you multiply them in the other way, the result will be this strange matrix, which is not identity of size three. So this is another point which tells you that identity matrix, it should work before you claim that something is an identity. People have to verify both ways. One way, sometimes not enough. Well, to be fair, I should also tell you, in relation to this comment, is that this effect where when you multiply one way, you end up with identity, and when you multiply the other way, you don't end up with identity. This effect happens in the known circumstances, and I will tell you those 
First of all, it happens when matrix is not square. And second, it happens when your matrices are, which is way beyond this topic, is when they are of infinite size. So the fact which you should know, actually, is that this effect does not happen when your matrices are finite and square. So that's why I said this is less relevant. It just, it's a good example, but it's less relevant to the discussion of the inverses. If, if your matrices are square, there is, there is such result, even though the proof of that result is quite difficult. There is such result which says that if you have two, if your matrix A is square and you have the relation, one relation, AB equals identity, you can immediately claim that the, the other way you will have identity as well. It's a very difficult result. It's a very deep proof there, actually. But there is such result, and I'm happy, I mean, I'm, you, you, can, you can use that result as long as you register that you're using that. Yeah. That's why this example, it's, it's a good example, but in the domain of, or in the realm of square matrices, it's, it's irrelevant. Yes? You already know without having to switch it that it's not the identity because they have to be in the same dimension. Because I'll tell you where, um, if A and B are both, it's the dimension N and N. Yeah, you may say it this, this way as well, but that's actually, no. You're right, yes. Yeah, probably that, that will be the simplest way to resolve this issue. This is a very marginal example, which tells you that you know, when you don't deal with the square matrices, I inverse, the concept of the inverse becomes far more complex. There are some studies how to do that, but it will be in the other course. In this course, we only focus on square matrices, and in square matrices, this doesn't happen. If you have the product AB in one way equals identity, if you flip the factors, you don't even have to compute that. You can be absolutely sure the result will also be identity.